Hi students, this is Professor Gordon, and I'm here on Friday of week two to talk to you about a story that we read this week, Sonny's Blues by James Baldwin. And I want to use the story to uh, say a little bit about tone and plot, the two elements we're studying, and I'm also going to talk about figurative language. Uh, Keyshawn in section VD, I think it was, had a great question in his brainstorm list. I hope some people took that question. It said, why did Baldwin use figurative language so early in the story? First, I was like, whoa, using literary terms from a future week. So that's cool. Um, and also, since figurative language is one way that writers create tone, um, I was like, it's okay to talk about it early. Um, and in essay one, you're using any piece. You pick it from weeks one to four, and you're using any literary element, really from the whole semester. I'm suggesting from weeks one to four, since those are the ones you will have studied. But if you want to look ahead, and usually in the journal, I'm giving essay tips. So you might say some amazing things about a story or a poem. And I'm like, oh, whoa, you're talking about symbolism. So look ahead at that week and, you know, spend a half hour on the symbolism lecture. And then you have a better essay one. Okay, so so um, Keyshawn said, why is Baldwin using figurative language early in the story? And you may remember from the plot lecture that, uh, most of the times, especially a longer story or a novel or a film, authors and directors use the beginning of the piece to give the background information, to orient us. Who are these people? Where do they live? What country is it? What decade is it? What happened to them today? What are they wearing? What's the setting? You know, James Baldwin doesn't do that. He goes right to the internal universe of their emotions and their experiences. So um, I just want to look at those first two paragraphs with um, Keyshawn's question in mind. And I want to read the first paragraph because it sets the tone and doesn't give us hardly any exposition. And I want to read the second paragraph because that's where the figurative language that Keyshawn was talking about happens. And then I want to look at a later case of amazing figurative language a little bit later in the story. Um, and somebody else, I think it was Kayla Wright. Oh, I'm sorry if I had this wrong. Somebody else said, where is the climax to this story? And that's a tricky one because it's not an action story. You know, it was a bank robbery story. The climax could be, you know, when they actually get the money and drive away. But it, the, the action here is internal. It's emotional. It's maybe spiritual. Um, one could argue it's psycho psychological, it's cultural, it's, it's a lot of things going on inside. It's huge pressures and forces, um, but they're invisible because they're happening inside people's experience and inside their families. Um, and I, and I think Baldwin's style, um, uh, announces that to us, lets us know that, that that's the kind of story it's going to be. And somehow it still hooks us, you know, the way a car wash hooks your car, you know, the expensive car washes where you drive in and it hooks your car underneath and you can just, you keep it in neutral and you just sit there. Um, the story does that for a lot of readers. It hooks them. Okay. So I want to look at the first two paragraphs. Here I go. I read about it in the paper, in the subway, on my way to work. I read it, and I couldn't believe it, and I read it again. Then perhaps I just stared at it, at the newsprint spelling out his name, spelling out the story. I stared at it in the swinging lights of the subway car, and in the faces and bodies of the people, and in my own face, trapped in the darkness which roared outside. It was not to be believed, and I kept telling myself that as I walked from the subway station to the high school. And at the same time, I couldn't doubt it. I was scared, scared for Sonny. He became real to me again. A great block of ice got settled in my belly and kept melting there slowly all day long while I taught my classes algebra. It was a special kind of ice. It kept melting sending trickles of ice water all up and down my veins, but it never got less. Sometimes it hardened and seemed to expand until I felt my guts were going to come spilling out or that I was going to choke or scream. This would always be at a moment when I was remembering some specific thing Sonny had done or said. So that block of ice... We still don't know what the newspaper story said or who Sonny is. 
We don't find that out till later, but what we're finding out is we have a main character who's in a situation. He's in an emotionally intense situation, and Baldwin, in his first draft writing this, he might have he might have just just said block of ice because that's kind of a cliche. Oh, ice is running through her veins. That they say of someone who's cold. Or I, oh, I felt like I had a block of ice in my stomach. But he extends that metaphor, and a metaphor is just when you compare two things. Um, what it feels like to a block of ice. He extends that metaphor, and, and it's logical. And metaphor, a good metaphor is logical, and when you extend it out, it's got to stay logical. So he's like, I got a block of ice. Well, what does ice do? It melts. And just that's creepy to think of ice running through your veins, ice water. What else does a block of ice do? As it freezes, it expands. So if you literally had a block of ice in your stomach, you would... As this says, explode, and your guts would come spilling out until you choke or scream. That's how he feels. So the figurative language there is trying to convey an emotion. Now, if you haven't read the story, go read it and come back, because um, I'm about to do a plot spoiler. It's his brother. His brother's been arrested for, quote-unquote, peddling and using heroin. And that verb, peddling, dates the story, gives us an idea of when it is set, and other details give us an idea of when it was set. For 10 bonus points, send me an email with three details from the story that tell you what decade it is set in. And you could be wrong, and you'll still get the 10 points if you have three details from the story that led you to believe it was set in 2000, the, the 10s, or 1940, or when, or 1860. When was it set, and how do you know? Okay, so send me that email. And now let's look at another piece of figurative language, because we're still trying to answer that question uh, of um, Keyshawn, why did he use it so early? And then I would also add, why did he use it so much and so well? Um, and I've already talked a little bit about that. So I'm going to go to page uh, 24 in the printout. And you might want to use, just so you, you don't get confused about pages, use the link that I created in Learning Content. Go to that link, and these are the page numbers I'm referring to because I like to write on. As you can see, I like to write on a printout. I don't mind writing in books. I'll write all over a book. But this cheap book we've got has really tiny margins, and there's no place to write. So I'm going to page 24. Um, this is when Sonny, his younger brother, there's a seven-year difference. Sonny has gotten out of prison. This is before um, the war on drugs and the prison sentences were actually reasonable. So he's in prison for a little while. He's he detoxed there. He went through hell. Um, and he came out, and his older brother goes to pick him up and drive him back, and he's going to live with them for a while while he gets his life together. Um, and his brother, Sonny, says, can you have the car? He doesn't say Uber, so that tells us something else. Can you have the car drive along Central Park? Because he loves, you know, that's where they grew up, and he wants to see it, I guess. So we drove along between the green of the park and the stony, lifeless elegance of hotels and apartment buildings toward the vivid, killing streets of our childhood. These streets hadn't changed, though housing projects jutted up out of them now like rocks in the middle of a boiling sea. Most of the houses in which we had grown up had vanished, as had the stores, skipping a few lines, but houses exactly like the houses of our past yet dominated the landscape. Boys exactly like the boys we once had been found themselves smothering in these houses, came down into the streets for light and air, and found themselves encircled by disaster. Some escaped the trap. Most didn't. Those who got out always left something of themselves behind. I want to just stop for a minute, and uh, that phrase, they escaped the trap. You've probably said that. That's a kind of a, it's a metaphor, unless you're liter literally in a trap, but if you're just like, uh, you know, you're behind on your rent, you're like, oh, I feel trapped by the, my low-paying job, um, you're not literally in a trap. 
So this is a metaphor, but it's a cliche. It's not like a new, fresh metaphor. And good writers, which Baldwin is, make the language new. They, they uh, get as much as they can out of those dead metaphors. So look what he does with this dead metaphor of trapped. Some escaped the trap, most didn't. Those who got out always felt something of themselves, always left something of themselves behind. As some animals amputate a leg and leave it in the trap. It might be said, perhaps, that I had escaped, the narrator math teacher says. After all, I was a school teacher. Or even that Sonny had escaped. He hadn't lived in Harlem for years. Yet, as the cab moved uptown through streets which, seem, streets which seemed with a rush to darken with dark people, and as I covertly studied Sonny's face, it came to me that what we both were seeking through our separate cab windows was that part of ourselves which had been left behind. It's always at the hour of trouble and confrontation that the missing member aches. And then he says a little later down, he worries. He wants to help his brother, who he left alone for, like, years because they had a fight about the brother wanting to do jazz. And now he's he's um, recommitted to helping him. He says, he worries, was I simply bringing him back into the danger he had almost died trying to escape? He almost died by going into the army, which the brother didn't think he should do. He was only 17, you know, and then... Um, his encounter with drugs was also life-threatening. So those two examples of extended language, I think, help us answer uh, Kaishan's question. But I want to hear more of your ideas about that and also your reaction. Like, did you want more plot at the beginning or were you bored by the beginning? Um, did you dislike the story and then you started to like it at some point? what happened to make you like it, or did you like it at the beginning and then you got lost, you lost interest or you literally got lost and didn't know what was going on. Um, if that last thing is the case, this lecture should help you. I'm just going to pause this for a second to see, to get my next thought.